also like to say thank you to all the speakers today. You've made me think a lot more about my work and um, the journey that I'm on with that. And also thanks to Sarah for bringing us all together. Dan, um, it's been really great. So um, this quote is something that also keeps me going um, with my research. It's one that really uh, drives me. When we love the earth, we are able to love ourselves more fully. I believe this. The ancestors taught me it was so. So I wanted to start with that. And then I'm going to move into um, talking about the Beach Co-op because that's really uh, a non-profit organization I started about uh, seven years ago, which actually started out as a voluntary organization. Um, and, it, and it really came from a place of love, a place of caring for the marine environment. Um, that is my local surf break. Um, it's eight minutes drive from my home. I drive in my wetsuit to the beach. <laughs> um, and uh, it was at a time actually when, no, it's more than, because my eldest son is going to be 13 next year. So I, I stopped working at WWF South Africa and um, because I was pregnant and I um, wanted to be at home, but I wanted to do more than be at home once I became a mother, I realized. And so um, this, this idea, because I would spend time at the beach with my eldest son, Maju, this idea to care for the marine environment that I was spending my time in arose. And because of my 10 years at WWF South Africa working there, I had many relationships with scientists. And so one of the scientists I, um, I met was Professor Peter Ryan. And I was saying to Steve yesterday that he's actually got the longest data set of marine debris plastic in the world because he uses this methodology um, called the Dirty Dozen methodology. But if I continue just to, to come back to place, because we've spoken a lot about place. So again, this is the area and, and try and remember the shape of this bay. Um, and even on this trip to, to America and, and working on the hydro rug, which I get back to later, remember this image of the bay because this is also the, the place where I live, where I surf. And I'm walking from Cape Point, which is this point here in the south, all the way along the bay, walking and swimming. So I'm using those methodologies as well to hung clip, which is on the other side of the bay. Um, but yeah, so that's the place and, and Surface Corner um, is where we've been practicing beach cleanups for the last uh, probably 13 years, um, every new moon. So it's focused on the moon cycle as well as a regular cleanup that, that I've been doing since then with, with the community, um, whoever decides to arrive. Um, and so that's, that's the, the kind of context from which my PhD research is emerging. Um, it's, you know, my parents, um, they were the first transgressors, I suppose, in my life. But they, they did things um, like take us to beaches in a South African context where only white people were allowed. But they never told us that they were doing that. So I have always felt like I belonged and they um, in those spaces. And it's only more recently that I've, I've come to realize that my brown and black peers hate going to, and I use the word hate, hate going to certain beaches um, that I don't necessarily mind going to because of not feeling that they belong. Um, so, so my parents, they, my dad learned to swim in the Lisbeck River, which is a very polluted river now in, in um, Cape Town. Um, and my mom grew up along that coastline that I showed you. So I, I've done some, some walking with her. And when I say, when I say the word strandlooping, that is an Afrikaans word for walking. So I'm using a strandlooping methodology, actually. Um, and my mom grew up and, and she learned to swim along the coastline. And that's where my love for the rocky shore actually comes from. Um, and and Strandlope is actually a, the derogatory name, um, according to June Bam, who is an African feminist scholar um, based in Cape Town. 
and the the tribe that used to walk along the coastline and trade was called the Goringai Kao. Kao. Um, and and the colonizers, the Dutch colonizers, renamed us as Strandloopers. I call myself a Strandloper. My mom calls herself a Strandloper. Um, she would harvest periwinkles off the rocky shore and cook food um, out of a need to survive, actually. So she's taught me how to do that, and I've in turn taught and shared that with my family and my three sons that I have. So, yeah, just giving you the, the context there. Um, what's happened to me through doing my research as well is this, this process of very strong assimilation. I mentioned earlier this morning of being um, someone that looks like me in the context of conservation um, and the practice of conservation, particularly in a, in a marine environment where black and brown bodies, they don't know how to swim. So, so my process of trying to fit in was a, one of a strong sense of assimilation. Um, I was lucky enough to do my high school years in what was called an open school. So once Nelson Mandela was released, the school system was opened up. And that's when my dad um, was okay with sending us because the opportunities were not necessarily equal, but they were more equal than they were before. Uh, so I was one of five people of color, brown person in a school, and that really, um, I suppose in many ways, was the start of my assimilation. Um, and so studying science, my background is science, and, and I'm a recovering scientist now. <laughs> so, um, you know, that whole process, really seeing the world as an experiment and very binary, is something I've been grappling with until arriving in a place um, where I've been doing my PhD in education and following a post-human, new materialist way of thinking about the world and, and really thinking of the world in relation with um, it, all the entities, human and more than human. So it's been interesting because the process of the beach carp starting out in this very scientific way with the help of Professor Peter Ryan and using um, the Dirty Dozen methodology, which you can read about on the website, really the top 12 most commonly found things you find on the beaches. And, and to where I am now, where, you know, it, it really dawned on me. I arrived at a beach to do a cleanup um, in the Eastern Cape, which is on our East Coast. And it was a a beach that has never been cared for. It was obvious, you know? And and um, the lifeguard comes towards that and he's confused. He's like, firstly, there are two brown people coming to clean the beach. Like, this beach has never been cleaned before. What are you doing here? Um, and then I'm, I'm confused why, you know, I, I don't, I'm like, yes, we're here to clean the beach. And he's like, oh, yeah. And then it dawns on me because a bus load of black bodies arrive. And they're there to have the day at the beach. And for him, he just couldn't believe. He, he said to us afterwards, the city has never come here to clean this beach. It's a forgotten beach. And that was the beginning of me uh, realizing that, that it matters which beaches we clean. And actually, the pollution is colonialism, which is the title of a book. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, and the types of dirt and litter that we find on different beaches is political. Um, and so the, the growth of um, my understanding of how important the work that I'm doing was vastly changed. And I started partnering more, we started partnering more with um, other nonprofit organizations and working with um, trying to get access for brown and black bodies to spaces like the one where all those bicycles are. It's, it's a Cape Point nature reserve, which not many of our black and brown communities have ever actually been able to visit. Working with indigenous leaders, working with graffiti artists, um, really encouraging water immersion um, for those that have not had that advantage. Um, so that's more about that um, and some of the quotes, you know, from people. 
which you can also find on our website. So then this leads me to, you know, my main research question, and this is what, from one of the papers, it's a little short clip, so you can also go and read the paper later on, is my main question for my research is essentially um, co-creating a pedagogy of care for our marine environment in a South African context. Given the Group Areas Act, which is one of the main um, acts that really facilitated and entrenched this um, removable, removal, the forced removal of black and brown bodies from access to natural spaces. And then there's also the Bantu Education Act. Again, you know, it resonates with what you were talking about, um, Maria. Yeah. Mia, yeah. Um, so really, you know, sidelining black and brown bodies from accessing certain information and keeping them in a, at a certain level of labor. Um, so this, this work along, again, along that stretch of coastline, um, there are many man-made tidal pools. Some of them are actually made on um, original uh, First Nations people's uh, fish traps. So there's historical legacy there too. And when I play the video clip, it is of me swimming in a tidal pool, which is one of the, the spaces my parents took us to, which not many of my brown and black peers feel safe at. Um, and it's an overlay with my mom's voice because she's one of the interviewees or intraviewees, I call, I call them, at these tidal pool spaces. So here we go, I hope it works. Do I need to put the sound up? Otherwise we can skip over it and you can look at it another time. <laughs> There's also a voiceover in the next slide. Let's try that. Need to try that. The sound? Um, I'll go through. Oops, yeah. To know that there we, go. Yeah. we can be there for each to other it. from one generation to the next. Um, Stitching and caring our lives together. Um, getting mending, getting a, a better way, even if I didn't understand it before. Just looking at this cloud, mm. how beautiful it is. Mm. But, um, and she's coming towards us. <laughs> <laughs> Shaped like a wave in a way. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, by mending, hopefully, we can also mend our society at large, not just us, because it would be a ripple effect mm. on everybody. And it comes back to water, the ripple effect of life. So by whatever goodness we have within us, and we all have, despite whatever challenges we have, Whatever heavy days we have, there are goodness in each and every soul. And if we tap into that and we bring it out and share it, how small it can be, you know? So my mom's talking about the hydro rugging process um, when she refers to mending. And so this is another one of my methodologies. There's the strunk looping, swimming, and all in this, this false bay of Cape Town. Um, the bay is called False Bay, from Cape Point to Hunk Clip. And so the beach cops, you know, the cleaning, the beach cleanups, collecting that waste, taking that waste, and using um, waste, other waste material, so from upholstery companies, um, and then coming together with those materials and sharing stories of our marine life, our connection to the ocean. Um, and this process is called the hydro, rug, hydro rugging process. So I'm essentially creating um, what I'm calling a mother hydro rug 
Each person in this workshop creates their own with the beach litter that I provide and the waste materials, sharing their stories. And it's a process of mending and healing. And again, because of the relationships I've had for many years through WWF and through having the nonprofit organization, um, I've been able to work with Black Girls Rising, with Waves for Change, um, with the Fisher Child Project. These are all other nonprofits working with black and brown bodies to try and um, get them into spaces and places and build their confidence because of our Group Areas Act, because of our apartheid legacy that we still live with today. And the hydroroging process is something I'm going to share with you all tomorrow, um, which I'm excited to do. Um, oh, sorry, yes. So this is one of the... Um, one of the participants and I was lucky enough to also have my first d debut and, and again even the words I'm, I'm unlearning because I don't like to refer to the mother hydra rug as mine it's a collective project um, okay <laughs> and so yeah this this space that was created was actually at a gallery um, it's called the Ites Gallery, and it's based right in town, very close to the Green Market Square, which is another iconic space. And it's actually the space where slaves were sold. So there's this layered history um, and bringing, uh, and also then bringing in brown and black bodies into a gallery space, which is a, a space that is seen as elitist, is seen as white, as, as, as if they do not belong there. A lot of them... Um, were afraid coming into that space but the the art pieces on display um welcomed them too so and they were all collective art projects and and we used it as a classroom um so this is some of the work that i'm busy writing and and i've had some internal reviewers comments which i mentioned earlier that i have to go and sit with um but here's the the voice of one of the participants oh did it play? Let's go. The ocean could say one thing to me. Yeah, cool. Um, because oh, growing okay. up, I used to um, hear the sound that the ocean makes, especially like afternoon times. It like make the terrifying sound when the waves are splashing. So I'm, I was always terrified of the ocean. But if the ocean could actually speak to me now, the mm -hmm. one thing it'd say um I am a safe place. I can drown you. I can float you. But most of lo most of all, I am protecting the world underneath me. Yo, I am protecting the world underneath me. Yeah, I I must say I'm profoundly moved by these stories and I feel a deep deep sense of responsibility to hold them um, oftentimes they bring me to tears and when I re-listen and re-listen you know we were talking earlier today as well about ethics and I I try I, do, I don't like using people's names so I haven't done that in my papers even though you'll see I've got the ethics form for all of us to use tomorrow I prefer to keep it anonymous some for some reason, even though I could use their names. Um, but, they, you know, I, and I, I, I also have questions around how I display this art piece that belongs to all of us um, and honor all of those stories and all of those emotions because, you know, they, they don't all come from um, a place of happiness and joy. Yeah. So uh, this is another exercise, just coming back to, to that first map that you would have seen earlier. And this is something I did with my three boys, actually. Um, so I, what I decided to do was to get a massive piece of brown pattern making paper. And I, uh, I tried to position my body in the shape of the bay. So that's the white outline with my arms. I'm, I'm headless. <laughs> and those are my legs. And then I just let them run 
free with coloring in and it's just was an embodied approach that I wanted to share here because it's this very body that I'm walking and swimming and mending with. Um, so it was an exercise with them and, and even the word drowning is not something that I, uh, you know, it, it came from them. So my, at the time they were 12, 7 and 5 years old. Yeah. Um, so just to tie in with, with the stories and then just another memory of the bay. So you'll see tomorrow I, I've started creating on this very trip to, to America um, a map with this, this shape of the bay. I've started stitching it and I'll share with you tomorrow when we do our hydro rugging session. But I want, what I want to do is flip it the other way around, which, you know, is not how we convey. We always look north-south, so I'm trying to... So I'm playing with ideas of how to display it. And I've been thinking, I was mentioning to Steve yesterday, um, having it displayed on the floor. And I think I was chatting to you, Dan, about footprints. And so I've, I've been lucky enough to come to the Americas um, twice this year already. I'm feeling exhausted by all the travel. But what it's... Uh, Re brought to me is the my ancestors would have come from Malaysia and India and and so there's that slave route all the way to the Cape and then there's the other slave route yes mm -hmm. and so you know this is kind of the meeting point of that and I'm I'm playing with how I display that mm -hmm. with with the various hydro rugs that we uh, create on either side yeah um, and, and then, you know, we've spoken a lot about borders and this in between the binaries, the liminal zone is what I call it. And I'm walking along the liminal zone between the land and the sea. Um, and, and often I like to walk at new moon or full moon um, because that's when the tides are at their most extreme and um, the things that I may see that I wouldn't ordinarily see because it would be covered by water because of the tide. And this was something, uh, a group, the, the group in this image, they called the Shark Spotters. It's another nonprofit organization um, that I've also known for many years. When I worked at WWF, we actually funded the program. And it's a, um, a way to spot sharks. So we have spotters spotting sharks to warn surfers or water users to get out the water when they see a great white instead as opposed to putting up nets because often they're whales and seals and dolphins and so it's it's trying to prevent those other mammals from being trapped um, and they do more than just the shark spotting i have even strunt looked with them which was an amazing experience um, for me what's really happened with this work as well is how it's transforming transforming me and my perceptions and my stereotypes as well. Um, and I found that the most moving about my research. But in this image, you know, here there was an extreme low tide. There was a massive swell beforehand. And, uh, you know, working in the liminal zone, you're not sure what you're going to find. It's always unpredictable um, and you need to respond accordingly. You need to be in attunement um, with what's happening around you. And here this they predict was an old oil spill um, and I just found it quite fascinating that the, there are so many things yeah, we're unsure of um, in this liminal zone um, but we need to stay in the messiness you know stay with the trouble um, yeah and that's that's my presentation thank you